all. Has anybody got any questions this morning? And Joel Shanahan. Oh, thank you, Judy. Uh, so in our Monday Night Boys study, we've been going over some of the um, minor prophets, and we got to Joel chapter 2. Um, and our question kind of comes from verses 1 through 11, yeah. because verse 11 seems to be talking about, or it seems to indicate that we're talking about, um, you know, the church, and it's kind of a prophetic thing. The Lord utters his voice before his army. Uh, surely his camp is very great for strong as he who carries out his word. But there's other context and uh, you know, indications that we're actually talking about, you know, the, the army that God uses to accomplish his, his will, you know, like Babylon or Syria or something like that. So just uh, wanted some clarification on, on those verses in particular. Yeah. Okay. That's a great question. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, not many people read Joel, so, you know, it's not a question that comes up, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great one. So, you know, Joel chapter 1 starts out, you know, you got these locusts, okay, coming. Every kind of locust. Okay, and why are they coming? Well, because God's punishing, you know, the nation. Now, we can't we can't tell from Joel. Uh, we don't know whether he's talking specifically Israel or specifically Judah or in general. See? And, uh, but when we get time to get to chapter 2, <coughs> Then you got this army that's coming in here. Um, and let me read verses 1 and 2 of Joel 2. It says, Blow a trumpet in Zion, okay, which that's at least, you know, Jerusalem, focused on Jerusalem and Judah, maybe. Uh, Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord's coming. Surely it is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. As the dawn is spread over the mountains, so there is a great and mighty people. There's never th been anything like it, nor will it be again after it, to the years of many generations. Okay, so it, this is actually a physical army that's coming to execute God's judgment. In verse three, he says, "A fire consumes before them; behind them, a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, desolate wilderness behind them, and nothing at all escapes them." Okay, so this is this is actually a physical army that's coming either the Assyrians or the Babylonians. We don't have enough information. Can't tell exactly when Joel was written. You know, best estimate somewhere around 800 B.C. But uh, again, it's one of those things you don't have enough information to know for sure. And uh, <clears throat> so, but you got this uh, army of desolation. And typical of the minor prophets especially, you have a picture of God's judgment. Notice this is the day of the Lord here in, uh, in Joel 2, 2, I think. Yeah, day of the Lord, day, verse 1. Okay, there's lots of days of the Lord in the Old Testament. Again, it's a day of, of God's execution of his judgment and, uh, you know, bringing in something great or something new, all right? So, <clears throat> though you got those physical days of the Lord. When you get to the New Testament, you have two days of the Lord. You have the day of the Lord, the great and awesome, or the great and glorious day of the Lord, which is a reference to the day Jesus ascended. And then you have the day of the Lord that comes like a thief, where the world goes away. But you have examples of this in the Old Testament with a lot of similar type language. Um, <clears throat> but again, what God's doing is physically he's setting the stage for the ultimate spiritual. So in uh, verse uh, 23, Joel 2.23, he says, So rejoice, O sons of Zion, <clears throat> and be glad in the Lord your God. For he has given you the early rain for your vindication, and he has poured down for you the rain, the early and the latter rain as before. The threshing floors will be full of grain, the vats will overflow with new wine and oil. Then I will make up to you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the creeping locust, the stripping locust, the lawing locust. And the great army which I sent among you, you'll be satisfied, you'll have plenty to eat and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you, then my people will never be put to shame. Thus you will know that I am in the midst of Israel, and I am the Lord your God, and there is no other, and my people will never be put to shame. See, now he's making the switch <clears throat> over to the spiritual people. See, when he says never be put to shame, that's, that's not a prophecy of <clears throat> physical Israel. This is, this is the coming of, of the church. And, of course, verse 28 
you recognize this, I'll, it'll come about after this, I'll pour out my spirit on all mankind the way the New Testament brings it about in the last days. <clears throat> and of course, this is a prophecy of the coming of the Holy Spirit on the apostles on the day of Pentecost, the, uh, <clears throat> the, the beginning of the church, um, as it says in verse 32, will come about that whoever calls in the name of the Lord will be delivered or will be saved. Uh, that's a spiritual salvation there and uh, occurs when a person's immersed upon the name of Jesus Christ. Um, and, uh, of course, then we have a prophecy of it getting to the Gentiles as well in there. So <clears throat> the early part is the physical army, typical Old Testament destruction, then followed by the rays of hope for the, the coming new people and coming new covenant. So that's pretty much the way that breaks down. Does that help, Joe, for the comments on that? So the day of the Lord in verse 15 of chapter 1 and throughout chapter 2, that's physical Old Testament day of the Lord. Yep, yep. yep. See, and they, they, so a lot of times, you know, the history ends up being important, trying to figure out when it was written, you know, and under what conditions it was written, and then being able to use that to set the stages. But uh, some of those indications there, you know, when he starts talking about, uh, you know, the, how does he put it here? The rain coming down, um, you know, the in verse 23, they poured down for you the rain, the earlier and latter rain. That's actually a prophecy of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Okay, now it doesn't directly say that, but Jesus gave us the principle in John 7, 37 through 39, where he said, as the Old Testament prophet said, uh, you know, out of those who believe in me, Rivers of living water will flow. And, of course, he defines that as the indwelling Holy Spirit. So you see, that's one good example of that. And that's almost always tied in to those prophecies of the future restoration and future reformation. So anything else, Joe? Other questions on that or comments on that? Would you just give maybe one other example of where the Lord uses that his armies to be like, you know, jet, basically not Christians, but like, like. Oh yeah, uh, Matthew twenty uh, twenty two. <clears throat> Matthew twenty two is a very direct one. <clears throat> Matthew twenty two, the uh, Jesus tells the parable about the king who gave a wedding feast for his son, right? And, of course, when he sent out the slaves, that's, that's trying to call the early Jews into Christianity, okay? And uh, they paid no attention. Um, you, know, one, you know, one went their way, one to his farm, another's best business. In verse 6, rest, seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. You know, Jesus talked about, or Paul talked about that in 1 Thessalonians 2, you know, say verse 14 onward, how they, the early Christians got treated by the Jews, you know, the apostles and so forth. And so in um, verse 7 then, it says, The king was enraged and sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Well, it's pretty easy to see that the armies of Rome are God's armies. And so in one sense, they're all God's armies, you know, the one of the great lessons that Nebuchadnezzar learned was he thought he was king. <laughs> okay. He thought he did that on his own. Yeah. Well, seven seasons of insanity, you know, helped him regain his sanity in a, in a major way. And he recognized this is God who raises up and God who casts down. And uh, it'd be really good if uh, the present uh, rulers of the world would uh, read their scripture and pay attention and understand how they got there. Because, you know, like even Pontius Pilate found that out. You know, he told Jesus, said, you know, I got authority to release you, and I got authority to uh, crucify you. And uh, Jesus said, you wouldn't have any authority over me at all unless it was given you from above. See? Okay, so, yeah, they're all his armies in one manner speaking. And, you know, for example, when the Assyrians came and basically butchered a lot of 
the, the northern nation Israel. You know, eventually God uh, punished them by the hands of the Babylonians for being so bad and so mean <laughs> to God's people. And then, of course, God punished the Babylonians by the Persians. And then God punished the Persians by the Greeks. Okay, <laughs> so you detect a pattern there. And uh, so they're all his armies. Uh, they all operate by free will, but by God's somehow awesome means of orchestration, everybody, every piece moves into his giant chessboard at the right place at the right time. And you and I can't even begin to process that. They don't, they don't have supercomputers big enough and fast enough to have that kind of algorithm. So, so yeah. Further comments? Another question? Another question today? All right, well, let's turn to Exodus chapter 4. <clears throat> so start working on the idea of uh, God's work with Israel. And uh, like I say, this is under the, the general heading, a, a pound, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And, uh, of course, Moses interacted with God on Mount Sinai and... Uh, on the, the angel of the Lord spoke to Moses in the burning bush, and so Moses has been sent down to Egypt, okay? And, of course, there's events that happen along the way, significant. But in uh, verse 29, Exodus 4:29, Then Moses and Aaron went and assembled all the elders of the sons of Israel. And Aaron, see, Moses is spoken through, speaking through Aaron, Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses, and he then performed the signs in the sight of the people. So the people believed, and when they heard that the Lord was concerned about the sons of Israel and that he'd seen their affliction, then they bowed low and worshipped. See, we, this is just a touch of review, but see, they're pretty excited. The Lord's concerned about us. Um, he knows the type of privation we're suffering here as slaves in Egypt, and deliverance is at hand. Okay? That, that's how they're looking at it, right? And, of course, these things are recorded uh, for our benefit. So Moses and Aaron come in before Pharaoh, and we talked about, and they want to go three days into the wilderness and sacrifice. And uh, Pharaoh says, no, <laughs> you guys are lazy. Get back to work. And uh, so, um, in fact, the, the punishment there in verse 10 says, so the taskmasters of the people and their foremen went out and spoke to people, saying, Thus says Pharaoh, I'm not going to give you any straw. You go and get straw for yourselves wherever you can find it, but none of your labor will be reduced. So the people scattered through all the land of Egypt to gather the stubble for straw. Okay? Now, this is making things tough. Making things really tough. Okay? <clears throat> but there's a plan. See, there's something strategic in motion here. See, even though the people are suffering, see, God's got a strategy. And, of course, these are recorded for our benefit so that if we start suffering as Christians, you know, we, we know that God hasn't abandoned us, but he's placing us strategically, all right? So they're scattered, gathering straw. They can't meet the quota, right? So um, in verse 19, in the foreman... Uh, Ephesians, uh, Exodus 5.19, Then the foremen of the sons of Israel saw that they were in trouble because they were told, You must not reduce your daily amount of bricks. So when they left Pharaoh's presence, they met Moses and Aaron as they were waiting for them. And they said to them, May the Lord look upon you and judge you, for you have made us odious in Pharaoh's sight and the sight of his servants. Put a sword in their hand to kill us. Hey, Moses, the plan isn't working. Okay? That's what happens when people think too short term. Too short term. The plan isn't working. I give up. You know, like Andrew was talking about the new creation and opening here. Well, I, I've had people say, oh, I tried it and it didn't work. Well, how long did you try it? Well, I, two months. Okay, well, yeah, right. What do you, what do you think? You know, it's good. You know, and how hard did you try? You know, I mean, did you really try to reprogram the mind? Did you really uh, renew the mind? Uh, like it talks about in Romans 12, you know, 
See, sometimes it's too short a, you know, you're looking at things too short. Uh, you know, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7 says that to humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he might exalt you at the proper time. See, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. See, kind of back to the same thing as, you know, as uh, Israel was experiencing. God cares. Uh, when's he exalt you? Well, at the proper time. And what time is that? Well, that's his choosing. Okay? And uh, so our job is to have enough faith not to be short-term about things. You know, it, it, and it may not, I mean, God's big enough to have things that we do have impact long after we're dead. See, so sometimes if you even look in, you know, if you've if you got to be like King Saul and build a monument to yourself while you're still alive, okay, that's too short term. Too short term, okay? But that's how mankind is. You've got to get it now, right? So they're upset. And uh, so when we get over to chapter 6, in verse 2, God further spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord, and I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. You know, El, El Shaddai, for example. But by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. See, that confirms what we would have thought there in Exodus chapter 3. Because Moses said, we don't know your name. What's your name? See, so when you see Yahweh showing up in Genesis, you know, the capital L small, capital O small, capital R small, capital D, that's Moses imposing his terminology on the period of Exodus, or period of Genesis. See, and you want to know, there's things like that in Genesis that you want to be aware of, Okay. And that's one of them. Now, your liberal scholars, see, they try to say, well, Moses didn't. Obviously, Moses didn't write Genesis. Obviously, Moses didn't write Exodus. Obviously, Moses didn't write Leviticus. Obviously, Moses didn't write Numbers. And obviously, Moses didn't write Deuteronomy. And uh, Moses didn't even get the Ten Commandments to God. These commandments were developed by thinkers in Israel, but they were attributed to Moses to sell them. Okay, that's your, that's your liberal theology. You know, they call it higher criticism, which is about as low a form of criticism as you can have. Uh, but that's, that's the sort of stuff you're encountering out there when you're going through and trying to establish the authority of the word. So it's pretty clear here. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, Yahweh, Moses, you were the first to hear it, and you heard it from me, and, uh, you, know, you, and you get to spread it along, Okay. And he makes it clear there in verse 5. He says, I have heard the groaning of the sons of Israel because the Egyptians are holding them in bondage. I remember my covenant. You know, the covenant really that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he says, I'm going to, in uh, verse 6, he says, uh, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Now, you don't get to know in the Old Testament, what that outstretched arm is, okay? Let's go to uh, John chapter 12 here. The quotation is going to come from Isaiah uh, 53, 1. I use this passage a lot uh, when I, we're trying to establish that Jesus is Yahweh because there's a lot of people, particularly in churches of Christ, that don't believe that Jesus is Yahweh. Okay, so John 12, in verse 36, Jesus said, John 12, 36, he says, While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become sons of light. He says, These things Jesus spoke, and I always like to put the name Jesus in here for the pronouns, because by the time you get to the end of this long quotation, you can lose track of the fact that the pronouns refer to Jesus, okay, which is significant. Okay, when you, when you realize that versions like the NIV interject the word God in places where they shouldn't because they're not following the prepositions through or the uh, pronouns through, it's important, you know, to follow it. You know, there, every pr uh, pronoun has an antecedent, okay? So, pronouns. These things Jesus spoke, and Jesus went away, and Jesus hid himself from them. But though Jesus had performed so many signs before them, Yet they were not believing him, Jesus. 
This was to fulfill the word which the prophet, Isaiah the prophet, fulfilled the word of Isaiah the prophet which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Arm of the Lord. Okay, well, we, we saw that, didn't we? <clears throat> for this reason, they could not believe, for Isaiah said again, quotation out of Isaiah 6, He blinded their eyes, and he hardened their hearts, so they did not see with their eyes, perceive with their heart, and be, for, be converted, and I heal them. So there's two, two prophecies here, uh, two things that Isaiah saw. You know, one is the Isaiah 6, the other is the Isaiah 53, okay? So we're focusing on the Isaiah 53 one today. <clears throat> These things, two things Isaiah saw because he saw Jesus' glory, and he spoke of Jesus. Okay? Just to prove that the pronoun referred to Jesus, nevertheless, many even of the rulers believed in Jesus, but because the Pharisees, they were not confessing Jesus, for fear that they'd be put out of the synagogue, for they love the approval of men rather than the approval of God. And that's a big line there, verse 43. Okay. But my point is, <clears throat> Isaiah is making it clear when, when he said, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? <clears throat> John and the Holy Spirit are making it clear that that's a reference to Jesus in glory that Isaiah saw. These things Isaiah spoke because he saw Jesus' glory. And he spoke of him. So what that does is that interprets for you all those Old Testament uh, writings and prophecies and sayings that have to do with the strong right arm or the outstretched hand or whatever. Anything connected with deliverance, that is Jesus and glory is the deliverer. Okay, comments or thoughts on that? So you have things like this in the New Testament that open rafts of understanding in the Old Testament. Huge, huge rafts. And uh, so back to Exodus chapter 6. He said, uh, with an outstretched arm, he said, uh, I'm going to redeem you. Okay, I'm going to, and going to take my, ex, you know, execute my judgments. In verse 7, he says, I'm going to take you from my people. I'll be your God, and you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Okay. Um, is that going to work? No. God said that he would dwell amongst them and walk among them, but it uh, never happened. Never happened. We'll see how that develops. He says, I'll bring you, in verse 8, to the land which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I'll give it to you for possession. Okay. Well, to some degree that came true physically. Um, not one word of the prophets is God going to let fall to the ground. But that wasn't really what God was looking at long term. Again, we have that perspective from the New Testament. Long term, God's using the physical nation, Israel, and the physical land to set the stage for a spiritual people, just like Joel was talking about with the spiritual land and all the spiritual promises. So any, any comments or thoughts on any of that? Now you can see, if you just read the Old Testament without a New Testament perspective, before long you're going to be off in the stratosphere someplace. You know, you're going to be... So far off, you'll be premillennial. Okay, you know, Gary and I, I think we're just, or Charlie, I can't remember. Gary, maybe it's Gary and I were talking about it. Uh, was it Gary, you and me, that were talking a little bit about it? Or maybe it's Bob. I can't. Somebody. I'm talking to one of the great guys around here. And uh, but anyhow, okay. So premillennialists, because they got the wrong perspective, you know, they're trying to, you know, put a, you know, just read the Old Testament directly, okay, they don't understand any of the parables that Jesus taught. <clears throat> they don't understand what the church is. <clears throat> they don't understand what the real important sacrifices are. They don't understand who God's people are, okay. <clears throat> they, they, they don't understand what the kingdom is, and they don't understand any of the Old Testament, but outside of that, they're pretty close. Right? 
See, it's totally amazing to me how people can actually have that scripture in their hands and get everything up, absolutely upside down. And that lets me know there has to be an evil force, you know, as the scripture said, blinding the minds of the unbelieving. They might not see the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who's the image of God. Okay, so in um, chapter f- six and verse, uh, okay, yeah, verse 20. Tina and I were just talking about that this morning. Um, Amram, see, now that's going to be Moses' daddy, uh, married his father's sister, Jochebed, right? And she bore him Aaron and Moses, and the length of Amram's life was 137 years, okay? And uh, let's see here, verse 23, Aaron married Elisheba, the daughter of Amanadab, and the sister of Nashan, and she bore him Adab and Abihu, Eleazar, Eleazar and Ethamar, where we heard her name before. Well, not hers. Minadab, Nashan, where we heard those names before? Tribe of Judah. <coughs> Ancestral lineage in Genesis in Matthew chapter one of Jesus. Okay. Just thought I'd let throw that in. Uh, Tina picked it out in her reading, so I gave her a high five for you know <coughs> close reading. You know. See, some of those details are... Why would the scripture record that? Just so you know. Just so you know. So we got the listing there. And um, so Aaron's going to be Moses' spokesman, right? And, of course, in, in chapter 7, verse 8, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying... When Pharaoh speaks to you, saying, Work a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh, and may become a serpent. Right? <clears throat> of course, this is one of the famous sections here. So Moses and Aaron came to Pharaoh, and they did just as the Lord had commanded. Now, that's always important to do just as the Lord commanded, right? <clears throat> and Aaron threw down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called for the wise men, the sorcerers, and they also, the magicians of Egypt, did the same <clears throat> with their magic, with their secret arts. For each one threw down his staff, and they turned into serpents. Real serpents. Yep. Real power. Yep. From God. No. Paul let us know their names were Janus and Jambres. Okay. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. <laughs> okay, all right. You know, Aaron's snake went around, ate their snakes, and Aaron grabbed it by the tail, turned back into a staff, right? How about Pharaoh? He's processing really well. Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He didn't listen to them, as the Lord said. Why? He doesn't want to let those people go. See, there is a tendency of those in power to enslave those who are underneath them. And you don't ever want to forget that principle. Scripture records these things for mankind's benefit, you know, if, if they'll listen. And uh, when they got you as slaves, they don't want to release you. So you're, you're seeing, <clears throat> you know, now you're starting to see the, the iron claws of uh, a, a government that's about to enslave you. You're starting to see those iron claws appear. They've been hidden back inside the, you know, the fluff of the paws. Uh, they're there, but now you're starting to see those claws. And uh, once those claws get you, it's very hard to get out. It takes a deliverance from God to get you out of there. And uh, that's why it's very important that we as Christians focus on spiritual things. But there's a lesson here. Pharaoh isn't going to let him go. Yeah. Gary? That's, that's an... You know, Thomas Jefferson said, In matters of government, speak to me no more of confidence in men, but bind them down from mischief with the chains of the Constitution. Now, this should be related. Because um, when Joseph's in charge, or not in charge, but he's under Pharaoh, all of the people, all of the Egyptians are slaves. Mm-hmm. And then you get to, and they lost their property and everything. Mm-hmm. Then you get to Exodus chapter 1, and there's that new Pharaoh and so on and so forth. But is there anything like in secular history that would tell us how the people did get their land back and they got their freedom back? 
But we don't okay. know how much of their land they got back. Okay, but they just got the freedom back, right? Or no, no. We don't know that either? No. They're, I mean, when you have a, a king, you know, the, basically everybody's servants of the king. Okay. See, and that's how it was for Pharaoh. That's how it was for your, for England. You know, I mean, even the pilgrims, when they landed, you know, they dedicated what they were doing to our dread sovereign, you know, and we claimed the land for the king. See, so everybody's a slave in one way or another with varying degrees of freedom inside that slavery. So that's how the Egyptians were. Okay, so in other words, when this new pharaoh comes in, Exodus chapter 1, he already has the Egyptians in slavery in a sense. Yeah. Okay, now he's looking to incorporate the Jews as well. Exactly. Yeah. But see, as near as we can tell, the, the new pharaoh that came in were the Hittites. You know, Hittites came in from what's now western Turkey. Remember, Abraham bought the cave of Machpelah from Ephron the Hittite, see, the sons of Heth. So the Heth, you know, the descendants of Heth became the Hittites. It's a great nation, you know, a lot of history there. And uh, recently they were able to figure out how to decipher their written language and stuff. But the Hittites, the Greeks called them Hyksos, um, came in from the north, captured Egypt about the time that uh, the events described in Exodus are happening. See, so it looks like an entirely new dynasty, which they could care less than about the previous history. You know, and you kind of see that carried out. So, But the people, underneath the king, you're still slaves of the king. And you see that. Um, let's go to Matthew 25. Matthew 25, the uh, parable here, it's uh, about like a, a, a man to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. Okay, so you can see that these guys are the slaves, the master. Now we go to a parable, well, parable in Luke chapter 19. In verse 12, nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself. See, well, we know who that's going to be. And he called ten of his slaves, see, and gave ten minus, and said to them, do business with this until I come back, and so forth. Uh, citizens hated him, sent a delegation saying, we don't want. See, but these are slaves of the king. So it's, uh, that's generally the picture um, when Israel came back from captivity, they said, we're slaves. We don't own the land. We're slaves of the people who don't own, own it. And uh, so when America became free, that's one of the things they said. There ain't going to be any titles of nobility in this country. So you're going to be a free man. And, uh, you know, uh, the idea was in America that God was going to be sovereign. And to the extent that God was sovereign, there was freedom. To the extent that God's being kicked out as sovereign, God says, all right, you want me to be king? Uh, then here's what you're going to get. And you're going to find out what it's like to be slaves uh, to earthly kings. And uh, so there's a lot of parallels, again, in history. But if, you, if you're under a king, you're a slave of the king. You know, and like I say, it's varying degrees of slavery. Sometimes it's indirect, sometimes it's direct. Um, you know, one of the things you can tell is really dangerous to serve in the court because it could be your head that rolls <laughs> today. You know, I mean, you know, how'd you like to be in the court of King Henry VIII of England? You know, he goes on one of his tirades. <laughs> Who knows who's losing their head? And... Uh, you know, the, the, the slavery was tremendous. And uh, you, you see that across the board. So, yeah, they're, they're actually slaves to, to what extent. I mean, they're pretty clear in Joseph's time. You know, they're, you know and Joseph being in charge of everything, you know he's going to be a benevolent, benevolent ruler, you know. And, uh, you know, so you can have a benevolent ruler. You can have a kindly king. <clears throat> but the next one might not be so benevolent or so kindly. You know, and that's that's the way it is when you're under a king. So, uh, you know, the 
Americans took the, the song, God Save the, Queen, the King, or the Queen as they say it now, and they changed it to uh, Our Father's God, to Thee, Author of Liberty. To thee we sing, long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might, great God, our King. See, and that's, that was America's history. They learned from the scripture, you know, that, that God's got to be king. I think William Penn had a great statement. He said, men must be governed by God or they will be ruled by tyrants. And uh, George Washington in his farewell address in 1796 said that you think you can divorce real, you know, morality from religion, you, you know, slight paraphrase, you're kidding yourself. Okay, you know, George Washington would never use expression, you're kidding yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, so you're slaves, slaves. And that's, that's a tendency of governments throughout history is to enslave their people. And, uh, you know, and it, 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 it's very simple, okay? Um, whoever cheats a little bit the first time has, a, has an advantage, right? So let's take performance-enhancing drugs and sports, right? Okay, the first guys that used those had a, had a little advantage, right? See? And, and what eventually happened? Well, eventually corrupts the whole, the whole sports world because after a while, everybody's got to use performance-enhancing drugs in order to be competitive, Right? See, and that's, that's the way these things work. The, the corruption is incremental. The first guy that's corrupt has a little bit of advantage. See, well, then the next guy has to be corrupt. And you can see the same way with government. You get a little bit of government to start with, all right? Then the politicians, they have to act like they're doing something, right? So they have to, they have to you know, do something. That is, they have to create a bureaucracy or whatever to do something for you. And step by step by step, see, your freedom is, is gone. It's gone incrementally in the same process that, that the corruption works in the human race as a whole. And uh, so, you know, the whole medical profession, you can see, has been corrupted by federal dollars. When you got doctors that are being fired, or a physical, uh, you know, PAs or whatever, uh, when you see them being fired for prescribing anything other than what the CDC recommends, you, how, how does that happen? You know, I saw, Katie and I saw on the news one night where a doctor of a major regional hospital, I think in, uh, in uh, North Carolina, you know, well-respected, all the credentials, and he got fired because he prescribed and was allowing the prescriptions of anything other than CDC recommendations. And he, of course, is going to court saying, look it, in America, the doctor has always had the right to prescribe what he wants, see. But that lets you know how much that's been co-opted by federal dollars. And uh, Rudyard Kipling wrote a little poem about that. He is entitled, Beware the Dane Geld, okay? Uh, Danish gold, in other words. And, uh, you know, he goes back to the time when the Danes or the, the Vikings, you know, controlled Bonnie, England and how they corrupted the people with, with Danish gold. But he was using that to try to let, you know, get the, the British to understand what was happening to them, you know, the same process. And, uh, you know, so you see federal money is a huge corrupter. Uh, it co-opted, uh, you know, the so-called scientific establishment in their belief and promotion of evolution. See, now again, these things are anti-God. So it isn't, you know, we're not just talking politics here. You're never actually just talking politics. And uh, so, but the scientific establishment gotten co-opted by federal dollars. So when Dr. Fauci says, I'm science, you say, yep, you are. <laughs> you're, you're a great example of what so-called science is uh, because it's all been co-opted. And that's why you have a hard time figuring out what truth is because everything has been corrupted uh, by the, you know, the federal dollars, the Dane Guild of modern times. See, nothing new in that. You know, the scripture got all kinds of references uh, to that. Uh, you could use example how the Philistines wouldn't let Israel have any iron implements. Okay. <laughs> Why wouldn't they let them have iron implements? Yeah. Well, it was called gun control. That's what, what it was called. See, there's... Again, those things are recorded for our benefit, 
upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So, yeah, the tendency of rulers is to enslave their people. And once they get them enslaved, they don't like to get, let them go. And, again, modern Americans um, didn't learn the lesson. They didn't pay attention. Um, you know, the, the founding fathers said the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. But you can see they were already asleep by the time the revolution was successful. Once they allowed a guy like Alexander Hamilton to, to come in and establish a national bank and uh, start doing the stuff that he did, okay, the system was already co-opted in the administration, first administration of President Washington, okay? And you would expect that. You expect that. If you read the, you know, the biographies of Alexander Hamilton and you put a couple pieces together, you realize that even though he was one of the guys that wrote uh, the uh, um, Federalist Papers, you know, he had a lot bigger plans for the federal government than he should have had. And that's why guys like Patrick Henry, those guys were called anti-federalist. And there's the anti-federalist papers out there as well. Um, but they, they recognized that guys like Alexander Hamilton, when they got control, um, do bad things for a country, right? So it happened right away. And they weren't, they weren't vigilant. You know, and they, you know, Washington had pressure on him. You know, I mean, there was no question that. He had, a, he had a war going on in Ohio territory with the Indians, and uh, Congress wasn't helping him out on it. You know, Congress, you know, didn't, didn't want to fight any war in, in uh, Ohio, <laughs> Washington. You know, so it was, it was tough. But that's what happens. See, the devil puts people kind of in a no-win no situation if he can, see, and impacts future on his side by that process. But we need to learn the lessons and, and pay attention so that we ourselves do not get co-opted, see, by the, you know, uh, Mr. Luke Wilson, you know, preached here on second on uh, Colossians two, eight. You know, beware of the being captive by philosophy and empty deception. There's a tremendous amount of that out there, and uh, every Christian has to really pay close attention so that he doesn't get sucked in by the prevailing philosophies of the time. And I'm going to tell you that's what it is. That's why it's called deception. You know. You know, if I tell, hey, Elliot, uh, you know, I've got a plan to steal the money you've been making at work. I, I, got, a, I got a means by which I'm going to siphon off your, your tips, so you should look out. <laughs> you know, nobody's going to do that. You know, that's the way deception, we're, we're, deception isn't going to tell you what it's doing. So these philosophies that we got and we're having to deal with are empty deception. They're empty, but they are deceptive. And so the Christian really needs to base his perceptions on what the Bible directly says. Otherwise, you know, you're going to get pulled. <clears throat>